we're good. Yes. So I'm Jeremy Schweitzer. I'm the Director of Customer Solutions for eThink Education. And I'm Courtney Bentley. I'm the VP of Services here at eThink Education. And obviously, I can't operate the technology. Uh, maybe? Nope. Oh, there it goes. Uh -huh. Okay. So our title said Moodle magic, and really it's more sleight of hand that we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, most of you are probably, uh, you're running Moodle installations. Uh, we know that many of you run multiple Moodle installations because you may have multiple audiences um, that you are trying to reach. Um, more and more, we are hearing needs around the need to target information to particular users, particular groups of users, um, really trying to personalize the experience. We know that you know, this is one of the things that Martin talked about in the keynote, um, is reaching users all over the world. Um, and so that need for personalization um, is a really big key to what we're hearing many of our clients need. So I'm going to actually walk you through a few of our examples. I thought Jeremy was going to talk about my fake tenancy, so I'll <laughs> jump in before he moves forward. Um, I always refer to this as fake tenancy. So what we're going to talk about today briefly is um, the way that we have been working with some of our clients. Oh. OK. Um, the ways that we've been working with some of our clients in order to organize their sites, um, in order to really leverage both core tools and some plugins, um, in order to do that sleight of hand. So Jeremy's going to talk you through a couple of examples. And I'm a walk and talker, so I am going to walk a little bit. Um, so one of the examples is really that idea of targeting different locations. So the example we have on the screen is showing you two, it's an area education association, those go by a lot of different names in a lot of different locations. But the idea is that they have a lot of different locations that they're all trying to target in slightly different ways, different courses that they're showing, different resources that they're highlighting. And so what we've really done is set it up so that when anyone logs in, they're seeing only the information for their particular location. So it's a little bit hard to see maybe on the screen, but when these users log in, we did an example from the Chief Leshai, if I burgered that and anyone knows it, I apologize, and the Bates locations for this particular one. There we go. It is the clicker. Now I know how it works. Um, th this particular example is a kind of student support program that's really designed around cohorts that are based year by year. So they have a year one cohort, a year two cohort, a year three cohort. And really what they have done is they are dynamically creating those cohorts enrolling people into a cohort, and then have a front page that is customized to pull in HTML blocks and other types of information that are specific to certain cohorts. So from an administrator perspective, the page maybe is a little difficult to look at, but from the end users, they're seeing only the information, resources, blocks that are really important for them. And then this is an example of a client of ours that is doing end user training around products. So each one of their clients, they want to be able to log into a single Moodle instance so they can share their courses across all those clients, but have a different tailored experience. So what they're really doing is using those cohort blocks to do every single one of their clients as their own block that kind of says, welcome to a particular company, whoever you're working for. And this kind of shows that you can create this kind of multi-tenant or fake tenant um, dashboard experience. And so just to reiterate what he just said, I think that many of you may be thinking, gosh, we do that already um, on the front page. And that is true. Um, many of our clients are also doing this on the front page in similar ways. They're using pretty much just access restrictions um, with maybe profile fields and things like that. Um, so what this is doing is leveraging both core functionality, as I mentioned, along with plugins. So when we're talking core functionality that we're leveraging, custom roles. So that first example that you saw where each of, the, um, each of the different centers receives kind of their own list in the course category, um, each of those centers is set up as its own custom role. Um, 
a little unwieldy to manage if you get up in numbers. However, um, the role itself is really simple, basically an authenticated user, and then we can push and pull other things as needed. Um, cohorts. So um, this is actually, uh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a story on us, I guess. We've been working, for, working with each other for quite some time, um, and I kept saying, yeah, cohorts is the solution. Cohorts is the solution. We should be using cohorts. And everybody looks at me like I'm crazy because everybody goes, why? Cohorts only do enrollment. They're very focused. Um, and so finally, we put this together and sort of broke, broke through that door um, that cohorts really can be used for more than just enrollment. I can be convinced and trained. It just takes a while It just sometimes. takes a while. Um, and then, as we've mentioned, access restrictions. So being able to use those cohorts um, for limiting access uh, to particular blocks, particular content. And then, obviously, visibility. So turning off the visibility on things, um, playing sometimes with CSS in certain situations in order to not make things appear hidden when they really probably are. Um. So Courtney was talking about the core functionality. We do to really create this more of a seamless experience. We are using generally some plugins to make this possible. So the kind of primary ones are um, the local profile cohort, which allows you to dynamically assign people into a cohort based on profile fields. And then the block cohort specific, which actually allows you to do something that people have really wanted a way of doing with blocks, which is making them hidden or shown to specific groups of users. It really allows you to do that. Anywhere that you are using a block, you can tie its visibility to membership or lack of membership, which is kind of cool. You can do it both ways, um, specifically in any cohort um, within the site. Um, both of those plugins actually come from the university, or Ulm University. They just kind of flopped their name. Um, and they've done a really great job of developing those plugins, releasing them to community, giving some basic use cases, and then also being really open to feedback on the code, um, any issues performance-wise or anything that we've seen. They've really taken that feedback and been great partners to work with. And then the last one, which is local cohort role. And this is one that actually that team also recommends, and one that we've actually used in the past, that it really allows us to say, OK, if this person's a member of this cohort, automatically assign them the system level role, which is where we're able to do things to kind of create this system level experience, um, which we're going to dig into in just a minute. So I always want to know, that's great. You've told me some of the tools, but let's dig in and take a look at how we've woven this together. So the first thing is creating. And if you know me, you know that I will prefer to automate everything if possible. Um, so create and preferably automate those cohorts. So what you're seeing here is that profile field-based uh, cohort membership. If you've not looked at this one before, you'll notice that what it's doing is allowing you to set up rule sets. So if the user matches this criteria, then add them to that cohort. So pretty simple to set up. Um, and then you'll see that uh, in the system available cohorts, you'll notice the source is now profile field-based cohort membership. Anytime a new user comes in, matches any of that criteria, it will automatically push them into that cohort. And one of the really neat, neat things about the plugin is it'll actually allow you to start building out business rules. So you can say, must match these two things to get into this cohort, or match only this one, match all of these. You actually have some flexibility for building out business logic within Moodle through this plugin. So then cohort uh, role sync to custom roles. So again, um, being able to set up that custom role and then define the synchronization so that um, the cohort that's been established then pushes into that custom role that I mentioned. Really, um, in this case, it's kind of a glorified authenticated user. Um, there's not a whole lot extra that it's doing there because then it's pushing them in as a learner to those courses where they need access. The nice thing is we're not excluding using cohorts for one of their primary use cases in the first place, which is enrollment. But you can also ignore the enrollment functionality of cohorts and use other enrollment methods um, if you're using something like the um, external DB um, enrollment method or anything like that. Nothing that we're doing here excludes using any other method. Um, so when you get to the point where you're t ready to kind of map 
those cohorts to the visibility of specific um, categories. So that's what we were doing with the first example we showed, which gave you kind of a rundown of these um, users log in, they're from this location, they can see these categories but not these categories. All you're really doing is going into the category level permissions. So this example is the Bates example that you saw earlier. And we've gone in and said the view hidden um, courses, no, view see hidden categories, sorry, there's both of those permissions. Um, you just add that basically that Bates role to that so that they can see that particular category and only members of that cohort can see that category. And so the result is potentially a custom view. So we went ahead and pulled those three examples forward just so that you remember um, what those looked like previously. So the example that you just saw kind of built out is um, the one at the top where Bates users are only seeing those Bates categories um, when they take a look. Uh, the one in the middle, again, is using um, dashboard view. It's using the HTML cohort blocks in order to distribute information um, to, that learn to that user based on their cohort membership. Um, and then the last one is aligned with their different um, companies within their organization, their different department areas. So again, notice it is on the dashboard um, where it is displaying that uh, specific menu set to them. I also know that people might have different setups. There are options for things like automatically creating cohorts through different methods than the one we use in an example today. So one of those would be if you're using LDAP for your authentication method, there's the possibility of mapping those into cohorts. So if you have a security group, you can map that automatically into a cohort in the system. So if you've already done that, there's no need necessarily to back up and do it through kind of that cohort mapping or the profile field mapping to cohorts that we kind of demoed today. If you're using that, um, when you're using kind of a standard restrict access, you can use profile fields um, to do that restrict access. But if you're using another method to create those cohorts, you may not want to then map that to an extra profile field. We would always try and avoid adding extra work and try and automate as many things as possible. So if you have that set up, there's options for doing things like standard access restrictions based on cohorts. Um, actually, the example in the middle, more, this picture isn't showing that, but they also have that set up so that they can do different things depending on whether it's a front page, a dashboard, or course page, allowing them to do even things like semi-multi-tenant courses where some of the content is shared across the cohorts, but some of it is shown specifically to individual members of cohorts, and so they restrict access down to that cohort level for activities and resources as well. So there's a lot of flexibility for how you build these things out. A lot of it really that we do is kind of stop and do some mapping. What's already in place? What's already automated? Okay, what are you trying to accomplish? How do we put that together so that you are creating that curated end user experience that you're attempting to build? All right, so I hope that gives you a nice um, kind of overview of uh, some ideas that you might take home and implement. Um, I think we have maybe a couple minutes for questions if you have them, and then obviously we're gonna be around for the next couple of days. You're always welcome to track us down, and we'd be happy to geek out about this. Could you wait? Sorry, can we share this microphone? Yeah, certainly. Yes. Um, so we can set cohorts, right? So within a cohort, can you set selective roles for um, different users? You know, an example would be, um, you know, I'm looking at um, not looking at non-academic setting. So probably say a supervisor with people who report to a supervisor. So can you set different roles for people within a cohort? That's my question. Yes, so um, find me, ooh, sorry, find me and we can talk. Um, we have done some things where we set a user relative to a cohort so that the supervisor then has access um, to view reports and information about their cohort. Yeah, it's a similar setup to what we're kind of talking about, but a slightly flipped use case. Um, and there's a couple other things that you can do to kind of streamline that. But yes, generally what you're doing then is assigning that role in the context of the cohort rather than um, kind of the version we were talking about where you're assigning the cohort in relation to the user. So it's, it gets into Moodle contexts. Those of you who have been around Moodle for a long time, you know that there are a lot of context and they interact in sometimes unexpected ways. 
Any more questions? I think there's one here. We've only got time for one more question. So uh, just this gentleman here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what would be a good rule of thumb for choosing whether to use a cohort or a role? Is there a, a preferred way or one way where one would, would be better for the other than the other? Well, I would say most of the time we're using both. So the cohort, cohort is really allowing you to identify the users you're attempting to target in a way that is readily um, automated. So if you already are doing this manually and you're saying it's a small group and we're just doing this manually, you could assign the roles manually and just skip the cohort. But if you're starting to talk about scale and wanting to do this across hundreds or thousands of users, the cohorts allow you a slightly easier way of assigning this in an automated way so that as soon as someone enters the system, you don't have to worry about them making sure that you manually go and add them to the right cohorts or add them to the right roles. The system pulls that information and automates it all the way through. Um, and we have clients that are doing fully manual or self-registration that are using some of this, but we also have some clients that have this entire stack automated. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But if you're talking small groups of users, you could skip some of the cohort pieces and just do it with a role. Okay, thank you very much to Jeremy and to Courtney. Thanks, everyone.